Uh, hi, my name is Pete Rizzo. I've been a uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency journalist uh, for going on nine years now. So since uh, 2013, uh, I was a founding editor at Coindesk, uh, now editor of Bitcoin Magazine and editor at large over at the Kraken Cryptocurrency Exchange. Uh, written probably close to 2,000 articles about various cryptocurrencies over the years, edited a ton more, uh, and you know, been uh, to all sorts of conferences <laughs> for whatever that's worth around the world. So, uh, yeah, happy to be here. Yeah, great to have you. So, you just published uh, an ethical argument for Bitcoin maximalism. Yes, you want to speak to that. Uh, Sure, happy to. Yeah, so uh, there's a couple of things I've been struggling with lately, um, kind of with a view of my background. Uh, I think one of those is there's a couple of popular misconceptions about cryptocurrency that I still tend to be troubled by. So one of those is that, you know, I think from a mainstream perspective, most people uh, think that it's okay to be neutral to cryptocurrencies, right? You can kind of see this in mainstream news coverage, BC coverage, that they speak about cryptocurrencies pejoratively as a class of technologies. And through that, I think lens, you know, tend to sort of equate their similarities. Um, so again, I think that that's problematic uh, because cryptocurrency is actually quite different. There's a lot of variances in their design. Those designs have impacts on users. And I think of that relationship is not quite understood. Uh, and there's some reasons why. So I think the reason why is that I think a lot of people have this view of the cryptocurrency market as a mediator of a competition between cryptocurrencies, and they view it as an effective mediator of those things. So they tend to sort of look at the cryptocurrency market, which is you know kind of a wall of different like tickers and, and number symbols, uh, and they uh, seem to be able seem to be looking to draw some conclusion from that. Uh, and I think as time has gone on, I've become less confident that that is possible. I don't think we are actually learning anything from the cryptocurrency market as it's constructed. And I think to the extent that it equates all cryptocurrencies similar, it creates a lot of problems for users. Um, and I think mainly the big issue with that is that when you look at cryptocurrencies, again, going back to the design and the relationship to users, they're actually quite different. So uh, again, to say that Bitcoin is Ethereum is Dogecoin and that these are all sort of related a related class of items uh, seems pretty problematic. And I think what really I wanted to bring to the fore is that I don't think that's a new argument, right? A lot of people have made that argument, but I think generally there's a specific way we make that argument, uh, especially from a Bitcoin perspective. We tend to argue against cryptocurrencies, kind of focusing on the economic um, aspects of Bitcoin, that it's the best money, that it meets the properties of money, uh, that it's you know the number one by market cap and it continues to be the largest cryptocurrency. So again, kind of an economic argument that evokes that we're getting some sort of information about the cryptocurrency market that's rational. Uh, we talk about the network of Bitcoin, uh, that it's, you know, has a lower cost of entry than other networks, that it's the most decentralized by some metrics. I think those metrics tend to be very confusing for people. It's not really clear why we use them. Uh, and then, you know, lastly, you might hear an argument about, you know, the launch of Bitcoin, that Satoshi Nakamoto, by virtue of, you know, inventing Bitcoin and by virtue of him disappearing from Bitcoin, this endows Bitcoin with special properties that other cryptocurrencies don't have. Um, I'd say that's a whole other argument, but I think that argument tends to come off a bit religious to people. Uh, you know, it appeals to this idea that something can't or won't repeat again and somehow is divine or immaculate. And we use all these sorts of, you know, strange verbiages uh, to relate to that event. And I think the one that I'd like to advance more of late, again, is the user rights argument. That again, these uh, softwares are different. Uh, the uh, entitlements that you have to value or money within their systems is not the same. Uh, and while it is influenced by, you know, factors like the economics of the network and the network and the distribution of the network and launch and all that, those sorts of things, uh, there also seems to be a fundamental difference in the tolerance for user rights amongst these cryptocurrency users, uh, which means that, uh, if you happen to find yourself in a situation where you don't agree with the majority of people who are using these cryptocurrencies, in some cryptocurrencies, uh, you have a greater protection of your rights to money uh, than others. Um, and I think that this is something that really differentiates Bitcoin specifically from the class of cryptocurrencies, right? I think that most other cryptocurrencies have a far lower to tolerance for user rights. They're far less tolerant of dissent. Uh, and because of that, I would actually really question like whether they should be considered monies or public good monies. If, if, if you want to call Bitcoin that, I think, again, it's Bitcoin sort of breaks classifications. So it's it's hard to really pin down <laughs> what Bitcoin is. 
Uh, but I think if you if you look at it from a user rights perspective, it's actually very easy to differentiate Bitcoin as being offering the most protections for user rights. I would say offering more protections than the existing fiat money systems in a lot of respects, and then extending that even further, offering even more protections than what you would get from other cryptocurrencies. Uh, and from there, I think we can start sort of teasing apart, um, you know, some sort of meaningful analysis of what, what these different things are, um, because I think some of the other lenses to look at it. Uh, while not wrong per se, there's nothing wrong about making the argument that a Bitcoin uh, most satisfies the properties of money. Uh, I just wonder how effectively we're reaching people there, especially when, again, one of the core problems here is that people keep looking at the cryptocurrency market, they assume that's rational, and then they sort of you know, assume that these things, because they're appreciating in US dollar terms, are doing good things. So there's like a moral equivalency <laughs> with uh, how much price appreciation is happening that, again, uh, I think from a more scientific perspective, uh, just doesn't really serve any purpose. Right. So do you want to dig into what uh, user rights are guaranteed by Bitcoin specifically and how they how they differ and how maybe they can't be really bootstrapped into existence to the same extent that Bitcoin has been? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, certainly there is no Bitcoin Bill of Rights that I'm aware of, right? There's nothing that we've come to that formalizes this. And I certainly, to the extent there would be a central body that could propose such a thing uh, in Bitcoin, that also does not exist. Uh, so as far as I can figure it, I mean, I, it, it does seem like you are as a Bitcoin user and that the Bitcoin user group acknowledges certain rights. Those rights would be, you know, one, the irrevocable right to your money, right? When you have a set of private keys on Bitcoin that is associated with your Bitcoin, uh, there are almost no conditions in which you would be separated from that. Uh, and I would say up to and including, this is the most important part, I think, you disagreeing with other people who are using that software, right? So I would actually say that if most, if, if all cryptocurrencies offer you the ability to use money, I would say Bitcoin offers you the right to your money and it makes that almost irrevocable. Again, I think we've seen instances where that has been challenged and, um, you know, there hasn't been any conditions under which that has ever been, you know, you have some individual has acquired a pair of private keys of Bitcoin and through some instance uh, was denied those through some aspect of the technology, right? So that's never occurred. Uh, I would say that everybody has the right to review and propose code, right? So Bitcoin is open source. I think that's well known. A lot of other cryptocurrencies are open source. And I think that right seems pretty you know, copyable through the ecosystem, through the other ecosystem of cryptocurrencies. Um, you know, you have the right to validate transactions and the economic rules of the system and something that a lot of other cryptocurrencies claim to offer, but there's probably different degrees of access there. Uh, so I know we could get into that. Um, but I would say, that, you know, probably the two biggest differences for me from that rights lens are uh, one, the right to a known money supply and predictable issuance. I think you know a lot, a lot of emphasis on the Bitcoin 21 million supply cap tends to focus on the you know, supposed arbitrariness of the 21 million number and not really on the properties that having a set number allows. So again, I think through a user rights lens, you know, that what does the 21 million Bitcoin supply offer you? Uh, well, it offers you as the user some right or guarantee to a known money supply, a known rate of issuance and expectations about how the Bitcoin economy will evolve that are again, far and away above anything we see on the fiat system and far and away above anything that we see in the cryptocurrency system. Again, in the cryptocurrency system, it's, it's by choice, but it's, it's still a meaningful differentiation, right? So for example, on Ethereum, we've seen the issuance policy change a few different times. There is no supply cap. Uh, so from a user perspective, you don't have a guarantee to either of those things. In Bitcoin, you do. Uh, is it uh, something that you know we can call a right? Um, I don't know. I think this is a framing that I like to use because I think it shows you what Bitcoin provides, right? In the Bitcoin system, you have the right to a known supply, a known issuance policy, and you even have the right to compete to that issuance, right? If you want to go buy a bunch of Bitcoin miners and you want to run them in your house or you want to purchase some location, there's there's no one who will disenfranchise you or put some barrier uh, to you doing that other than maybe a national government, as we've seen in China. <laughs> so, you know, uh, terms and conditions that apply. Uh, so, and I think the last one where I really cover in the piece, and I think this has been the most hard to kind of separate out over the years, is, and this is where really what I think makes Bitcoin very unique, is I think in Bitcoin, you have the right to dissent. Uh, so you have the right to, one, once you enter the Bitcoin system, once you opt in voluntarily, uh, you can continue using the Bitcoin system, again, up into and including in situations where you disagree with the majority of the users. And I think 
of all of the things that differentiate Bitcoin, I think this is the biggest differential uh, because what you observe in Bitcoin is a few phenomenons that I don't think have been really well understood for what they are, but you, I would say that you don't see them anywhere else. So a good example would be in Bitcoin, we've had several upgrades over the years that add additional functionality to the blockchain. So most notable of those was SegWit, Taproot is coming up in about a month. Um, in both those cases, you can continue using Bitcoin without upgrading to those things. Uh, and there are, are historical user groups within Bitcoin that continue to run older softwares that don't actually use any of these features. So a good example would be there's a specific group within Bitcoin that continues to run the Bitcoin code and maintain the Bitcoin code that Satoshi worked on independently of the Bitcoin core developers, and they continue to use Bitcoin. <laughs> they continue to have Bitcoin that's worth the same as any other Bitcoin. They can exchange those Bitcoins with anybody else, uh, and they continue using Bitcoin in all the same ways as the other users without those additional features that other people have opted into. Uh, so again, just kind of drawing that distinction. Uh, if you look at that case in, let's just say, pick another blockchain like Ethereum, uh, it is almost always the case that everyone there is running the same set of features and rules. And anyone who has at any point opted into another feature set no longer exists from the perspective of that ecosystem. Uh, so to make that really kind of real for people, um, you know, there are individuals within Ethereum in the past who have decided they don't want to use uh, certain features that other people uh, use. And in that case, they've simply, they no longer have their their Ethereum. Their, their Ethereum technically exists, like it exists on that blockchain. Uh, but for all intents and purposes, uh, you know, if they decide not to upgrade, uh, you can make the argument that they are, and this is the argument that I would make, is that they are disenfranchised, right? If you make the decision to dissent within that group, uh, your only real solution in that case is to appeal to the market for your rights. So a good example would be, if you go back to the historical schism within Ethereum, uh, there is a point at which the blockchain split. Uh, it, is, it split over the ethical conduct of an individual. Uh, a certain group of users decided to continue recognizing this individual's right to money, and the majority did not. They simply chose to build another blockchain in which this individual did not have the money <laughs> that they had on the blockchain. Uh, and that individual was forced to go to the market, appeal for their right to their money, and eventually convince that the rest of the cryptocurrency market uh, that in order for them to keep using their money, uh, they had to have to recognize the rights. So again, I think that that inherently means that there's a different relationship going on here, right? In one case, you have a user in Bitcoin where you are absolutely guaranteed your right to that Bitcoin up to and including you disagreeing with things that a majority wants and where you can continue coexisting with those other people without following the rule systems that they would prefer. And the other cryptocurrency systems in which you, you really see that in order to advance the veneer of technical progress at the rate that their investors require, uh, what they do is they operate in such a way where they make changes in a way that pushes out any, major, any minority group. They simply stop existing from the standpoint of their economies. Um, and again, I think you see a lot of justifications for this. So one of them would be that, hey, what we're doing is not Bitcoin, so we don't have to do these things that Bitcoin does. Um, again, uh, open verdict on that, right? I, I don't actually know if we can claim that other cryptocurrencies have achieved something different from Bitcoin. I prefer to look at Bitcoin as a evolving financial system that will continue to expand exponentially with the rate of human progress. Uh, I don't think that we've seen any claims that other cryptocurrencies satisfy a more, you know, a smaller value proposition uh, to, to really that there's a lot of evidence there. Is Ethereum a world computer? Um, you know, is uh, XRP a bank payment network? Um, I mean, I think it's very easy to call a blockchain, anything you want, it doesn't mean that that is so, right? We've seen the emergence of privacy cryptocurrencies or people using them for private transactions uh, does not appear so. So again, I think you have to sort of, uh, you know, take some of these arguments to the grain of salt, right? And one of them would be, I don't think we've seen any of these, these cryptocurrencies meaningfully differentiate from Bitcoin. So to the extent that they're providing something that Bitcoin is not and offering you less user rights in that situation, I would argue from a user standpoint, you would want to be skeptical of that. We just 
haven't seen that occur. Of course, you know, the vast majority of people who are using cryptocurrencies are simply buying and speculating on them. Uh, they're using these value propositions to justify their investments and to convince others to go in on that investment. And, you know, for all intents and purposes, this, con this continues, right? And I think, um, you know, uh, because there's no way to prove that these things are, are not happening, as people say, it just goes on, right? There's just a... Uh, you know, people buy and sell cryptocurrencies. They claim that these cryptocurrencies are different things. Um, and there's no way to adjudicate these disputes, um, you know, about what it is that they really are, right? So I think, you know, a lot of them exploit, you know, that relationship, uh, you know, again, in order to um, offer different features than Bitcoin, quote unquote. But usually in all cases where you find that this happens, it's it's, it's generally at the expense of some, group being denied the ability to continue <laughs> working with that chain uh, without which they wouldn't achieve that rate of technical progress that they have. And again, that's the big claim, even that they are, even that they are achieving that, right? So it becomes a claim. So is there a better or any form of ownership outside of uh, Bitcoin at all? I mean, I don't want to say true ownership to qualify it, but I don't, I can't think of anything else that you can keep um, without having it debased or having to pay to simply hold? Well, I think this is the question, right? If you start to tease apart uh, cryptocurrencies and you start to think of them as the, in the way that I've really framed this language is, you know, if it's true that they're always deferring to the majority and if the majority in all these cryptocurrencies sort of sets the rules and as a minority, uh, you don't exist, you cease existing, right? It, it, I think it's pretty easy to clear, see how you, if you believe that you are getting some form of property rights from these cryptocurrencies are in a weaker position there, right? Your property rights are essentially only valid up to the point where you agree with the majority or, the, or to the extent that you want to form a minority, the market agrees uh, to guarantee your rights, right? So I, I think that's the, the distinction there, and I and I, I would agree that there's still some discussion on this because I don't think anyone's quite framed it this way prior to me writing about it. And I'd say that I, I'm not sure I thought about it, you know, very completely before is that in Bitcoin, your guarantee is absolute within the code. When you have a set of private keys, there's there's no point at which, you know, that will be revoked from you. So in your, in your point, you know, ownership is absolute. And the other cryptocurrency systems, it seems that ownership is always occurring at the tolerance of the market in some way, either the tolerance of the majority of the participants in that system or the tolerance of the market to tolerate your minority dissent. And I think that, not to get too philosophical here, though we're, we're probably already there, that uh, there are a large group of cryptocurrency users who believe that offloading that type of morality to the market is okay. And that it's actually preferable to the situation that we have with governments today, in which if you want to opt out of a government currency, there is no option, right? So I think uh, it's a degree spectrum, right? The people who argue for fiat currencies, I mean, obviously their viewpoint is pretty clear. They're oftentimes denying the idea that Bitcoin exists or has any legitimate technical claim at all. Uh, they often believe that, you know, governments should have the right to issue money, uh, you know, on behalf of the people and then manage the financial finances of the nation uh, for those people on the premise that they're democratically elected. I think the cryptocurrency group, you know, by and large feels that anything that is not that and any system in which the use of cryptocurrencies is voluntary, voluntary uh, is preferred to that system, right? So they see it as a meaningful advance. I think the response from the Bitcoin community has been to say, that isn't enough. You have to absolutely guarantee the user the right to money. And any area where you would have to appeal to some majority or to the extent that you become a minority, appeal to some market system to support you, uh, you're essentially putting that user in a position where their right to that money uh, is not as guaranteed as, as it could be. And I think in Bitcoin, you're right that the, the guarantee is absolute. I think the question then becomes sort of like, what is the utility of a lesser guarantee? And to the extent that that lesser guarantee exists, does it make those cryptocurrencies a different class of thing? Uh, and should users be able to enter into that class of thing with the reasonable expectation of that? Because again, I think one of the problematic things is a lot of cryptocurrencies are essentially claiming that they are providing what Bitcoin is providing. You can even see this in kind of the writing of, 
figures who I would say have a nuanced opinion on the space, right? I think Edward Snowden put out a piece yesterday arguing against central bank digital currencies. Won't go there. Uh, obviously, those you know uh, repeat a lot of the problems of the fiat system. Uh, but you know, even he equates Bitcoin and Zcash and Ethereum and these other cryptocurrencies as 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 offering the same user rights. And I think there's an, even a line in his piece where he essentially, you know, says that he says that all cryptocurrencies, being decentralized cryptocurrencies, offer users the same rights. And I think that is emphatically not true if you actually examine what's happened. Yeah, I I'd agree with you. I'm I'm, I'm still curious how, um, if, if you could explain how it is that a newer or you know better Bitcoin could could never catch up because I've heard you say that before. It's Bitcoin is is the one, and even a direct copy of Bitcoin is is not <laughs> Bitcoin. Mm. Uh, well, I mean, again, never say never is a tough thing, right? I think Bitcoin, if you look at it as a system, there's a lot about it that seems very unique, and I think you can take different lenses on this. I think certainly Bitcoin is more unique than the cryptocurrency market would lead you to believe, right? If you look at, if you go on a coinmarketcap.com and you look at the list of cryptocurrencies, you know, the inherent inference in the design of that system is <laughs> these are all similar uh, competing systems. I tend to look at Bitcoin as being an innovation. Bitcoin is something that was invented. Uh, and I've, I've thought a lot about over the years about what it actually means to be an, an invention. I used to call Bitcoin an innovation, but I actually don't think that's fair. I think we've seen a lot of innovations over the years, right? Whether it's the smartphone or or the PC or what have you, I think Bitcoin is an invention. And the way that I would describe that by making a very tight definition is that uh, it, uh, it there, there was a rule or law previously in the world and it has invalidated that law. So a good example would be with the Wright brothers inventing flight. Like why did they invent flight? Well, because previously prior to them being in North Carolina that day and flying a plane in the air, uh, it was a fact that human beings could not fly. Uh, so that was factually true up, up until literally that moment. And every moment thereafter, uh, it was true that humans had, a, had attained the ability to fly. Uh, so I think if you look at that as the barrier for invention, that it, it invalidates a prior rule to the world, uh, with Bitcoin, prior to Bitcoin, you needed a third party to manage any money supply. We had never invented a technology that, that removed that. Uh, so any money system that, that had ever existed before then, uh, and actually put in place by humans, right? You could, gold was a naturally occurring phenomenon, always required a third party operator and Bitcoin invalidated that. It allowed you to, it allowed humans to manage a money supply uh, without any central operator. And I think, you know, we now live in a world where that's possible, right? A lot of cryptocurrencies essentially are claiming that they're they're doing different things uh, with that invention, or they're claiming uh, that that invention needs to or should be different. And but you know you can go to whole museums where there's flying contraptions that people thought would work, <laughs> and you know just never flew, right? So I think you know you saw this a lot earlier in the days of Bitcoin where. Uh, people would compare Bitcoin to the Model T. They'd say, oh, it was a great car, but there's going to be new cars. And every year there's going to be a new car that comes out. Uh, so Bitcoin is just the first one. And, you know, if you own a Model T now, well, you know, good luck getting on the highway because you're going to go 20 miles an hour. <laughs> so, you know, there, a lot of that was invoked, uh, you know, by saying that essentially Bitcoin would be outmoded, right? That something would replace it. Whereas in actuality, I mean, we've seen the Bitcoin ecosystem advance uh, uh, quite a lot, right? So I think uh, has it advanced? Uh, at the pace that some other cryptocurrencies have, like maybe not, right? We don't see uh, the uh, robust uh, uh, ecosystem of decentralized or applications on top of Bitcoin, right? We've seen applications sort of began on Bitcoin, they moved to other blockchains. In some ways, they might be returning, um, right? But we have seen the actual pace of Bitcoin design change potentially, right? So Taproot, the upcoming update is a good example. We're going to get a better, more robust smart contract contracting system that provides more privacy. Um, but I would say in that case, uh, there's no user rights trade-off. You simply either want to opt in optionally to using those different features, and if you don't, you can still use Bitcoin. <laughs> so, you know, whereas in other uh, cryptocurrencies, you know, generally when they introduce some sort of new feature like that, uh, again, there's always some group that has to, one, you know, put forward that update and then uh, two, usually invalidate or remove whatever minority uh, doesn't want to follow along with that. 
right? So they're, the, the, the technical progress there comes at some cost. Uh, the cost is, is, is the ability for users to have the same rights and guarantees, right? Bitcoin, I think, has found a way to uh, both update meaningfully and increase, you know, the quality of the technology that users enjoy uh, without having to make those trade-offs for user rights. And I think some of the most fundamental debates in Bitcoin uh, have all, always been over that. It's always been, are these changes worth undermining the guarantees of users? Uh, and in many cases, if you look at it from that perspective, of course, you're going to have a slower rate of change, right? Um, because <laughs> there's something that you're weighing against that's very valuable. Uh, you know, a lot of other cryptocurrencies, they, they simply just don't view it that way. They simply view it as, you know, whatever the latest uh, technical innovation that is capable of being achieved, it must be rolled out immediately. Uh, and, you know, the cost of that is that anyone who doesn't, for whatever reason, want to go along with that, uh, they simply cease existing to those projects. So, Seyfedean posits that for what it does, Bitcoin has no competition in this world. Therefore, as a final settlement layer and like guarantor of rights, um, we don't need to change it or update it. So what do you think about that? I mean, there are certainly a lot of people who would argue for that. They would argue for that Bitcoin is a protocol that uh, needs to be, quote, ossified, that it needs to stop changing uh, because these updates essentially every time they occur, uh, they they may put user rights at risk, right? Or there's some, you know, uh, I mean, essentially you see that when Bitcoin, a very conservative culture developed because, you know, the, the developers uh, who are working on the project, um, they attempted good faith updates that happened at various times that just didn't go as they planned. Like, so the, probably the most famous one was in 2013. Uh, they wanted to just put forward some routine upgrades to the code. They wanted to make some software improvements. And then through no fault in the actual code that they produced, but through how that code interacted with another kind of third-party software that Bitcoin relied on. So at that point, it used a software called, uh, I can't remember what it was, Berkeley DB. So essentially, this was the program that made the blockchain something you were able to save, right? So rather than making its own version of something that would compress data in a file for you to store the blockchain, it used some you know, third-party service to perform this very minute function for the Bitcoin system. So in that case, the code that they push interacted with that program in the wrong way, and it created two separate blockchains. So I think at that point, what you saw is that you saw within Bitcoin the movement towards a radical conservatism, sort of, you know, something where, hey, anytime we put forward any update, uh, there might be some risk that the system goes down or is invalidated or, you know, again, we might need to update the system in such a way where people who are running older softwares, you know, might be disenfranchised. And they saw that as just too extreme of a risk. You know, again, I, I don't, I think this is a question of, you know, the Bitcoin users will have to decide what they want. I don't think that there's any reason why Bitcoin can't continue to grow into a, you know, and I, I, and I think I've talked to the safety and about this recently. It's, I would prefer to consider Bitcoin as a financial system in which, uh, you know, finally a user has monetary consent, right, in any case. And I think we, we should want to expand that economy uh, to include all sorts of things that other cryptocurrency systems might also aspire to. So whether that's running applications, having things like the Lightning Network that you know run on top of Bitcoin and offer users to be able to opt in to certain advantages uh, that other people can't have and or don't have currently. Uh, and I think that that trade-off I and mean, Bitcoin is always going to be slow, right? At the point that you have something like the Lightning Network, something that lets you use Bitcoin for payments, uh, you know, are you going to say that you're never going to improve the core Bitcoin blockchain to continue that service? We spent four years working on Lightning. It's live today. It's enabling people in El Salvador and an entire nation to use Bitcoin. Uh, it's very hard for me to believe that we're at the end of that curve, right? Like in terms of how far we can push Bitcoin as a technology. So I think this debate also, also gets kind of condensed a little bit too much, right? So there's the core protocol and then there's different layers on top of the system, right? I think Lightning is the, is the first second layer and it's been phenomenally successful to the extent that it has been. Uh, but I think we'll see more layers, right? I think we'll see more things develop. Uh, always, you know, you wanna make minimum changes to the Bitcoin blockchain in order to realize these systems, 
I'm not a hardcore proponent of like total ossification because again, I think that um, Bitcoin is a system today that's only limited by human ingenuity. So why would you draw some constraint on that? Uh, I agree that that always has to be uh, buttressed by, you know, we have to continue to guarantee users the same rights that, that they've been guaranteed by Bitcoin. That's the inherent challenge, right? That's why uh, I think the extent that other cryptocurrencies um, appear more competitive, uh, it's they're simply obfuscating this lens. They're 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 simply you know they're simply positing that this trade-off doesn't exist, or they're positing because Bitcoin uh, will be limited, therefore something else should exist, and we will create it. So it seems that the rights are guaranteed insofar as you can protect you know, one particular piece of information. Um, and unfortunately, like all information is by definition copyable. So to my mind, the future will see a lot of Bitcoin banks and centralized institutions. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, there, there already are. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I don't even think that's, a, I don't even think that's a future case, right? There are uh, large custodians in Bitcoin and that have facilitated Bitcoin's rollout and, and will continue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would, what, what do you think about that? What do you think about the future? Do you think users are being usurped of their fundamental rights? But, and how do we combat against that? Or do we need to? Uh, I mean, again, I think there's different schools of thought, right? I think that um, from the Bitcoin standpoint, um, really what you're trying to achieve is a system in which the user has maximum preference and then you know, to the extent that they do, are economically penalized for some choice, that choice becomes reasonable. I think that that to me feels like the the definition of like what we're trying to build in Bitcoin, right? So I don't think that people in Bitcoin would say we shouldn't have banks, right? It's just that banks as they're currently instantiated in the fiat economy, uh, they have the ability to totally deny you access to your money, right? There's no way for you to withdraw. So in Bitcoin, you know, you have this idea of exit, right? And I would, I would really kind of press on that. So that in Bitcoin, I think the belief of many of the early Bitcoiners were people were opting into Bitcoin because they were exiting from the fiat system. Therefore, they were making the choice to exit and they were adopting this new system. So from the point that they are exited and have chosen to enter this new system, uh, I think it's not that no type of functionality should exist. It's that all functionality then should be at the consent of the individual. So if I want to opt in to use a bank like service, I should be able to, I should be able to also opt out of that service at my discretion without any penalty uh, from that organization. I should be able to, uh, you know, again, do any number of things with my capital up to my choice uh, without, uh, you know, being disenfranchised from that money, right? I think when Bitcoiners say decentralization, that is what they mean, right? I think that other cryptocurrencies, to the extent that they have tried to build similar types of economies, they're oftentimes building these voluntary structures and operating them with cryptocurrencies themselves. So they're operating these vo like voluntary uh, systems with new types of cryptocurrencies. So a good example would be a decentralized exchange is essentially a pool of funds, right? As it exists in Ethereum, it's you, you throw a bunch of different tokens into a pool. Uh, somebody writes a, a script at which people can take tokens in and out of that pool. And there's another economic token that you know incentivizes this activity. Is that something that you need all these other tokens to create? Absolutely not. You'll you'll probably see systems like that uh, happen on Bitcoin with, with smart contracts that move Bitcoin in and out of these systems. Uh, but through the seniorage of creating a new cryptocurrencies, you're able to inspire a lot of use, right? So I think this is one of the things that obfuscates. It makes it really hard to tell like what's actually going on in the other crypto in the greater cryptocurrency ecosystem, is because they can just create new money supply for any new coin that they launch. Um, it becomes very easy to stoke demand. Demand is implicit because you've introduced a token value and you're able to drive it to some you know higher amount of use through uh, really an amount of effort that might not be so high, right? In Bitcoin, you had a period where Bitcoin was worth nothing and then Bitcoin monetized. Bitcoin was data. It was almost like the spontaneous creation of life. You have data that was valueless and, and, and Bitcoin crossed that chasm, right? It became life, it became value. Uh, in other cryptocurrencies, they just operate on the assumption that, that it's, a, it's a state of the world that they take for granted, right? Um, so 
are, is there real growth in these other cryptocurrency systems? It's, it's oftentimes like very hard to tell. It's like, we may want something like a decentralized exchange of Bitcoin, where again, you just pool a bunch of assets together, create some script by which people can enter and exit uh, those assets, and that there's some monetary reward for whoever's putting funds in the pool and whoever's, you know, some cost paid by ever, whoever's withdrawing them. There's nothing about that design that would require like an independent currency that is, uh, you know, floating based on the use of that uh, protocol. So again, I think um, I think you have to remember that there's a couple, you know, different visions of the world sort of at war here, right? I think Bitcoin existed to stop the creation of new money, right? To offer people the right to a finite supply to the money, and then to promote voluntary economic structures on top of that. I think to the extent that other cryptocurrencies appear to be moving faster than Bitcoin and creating those things, they're often doing so because they are withdraw they're they're not offering their users a right to a known uh, money supply, or in many cases, they're just printing or creating new forms of money uh, to incentivize behavior. So, you know, again, from a perspective of economics, do you even know that the, the behavior would have rationally occurred in absence of that a sense of it's very hard to tell. So then you get, you know, you get a lot of arguments about are people really using decentralized exchanges for anything useful or are they simply using decentralized exchanges uh, as they exist on Ethereum, uh, you know, because there's the allure of US dollar gain. And to the extent that they're doing that, is that a valuable human, <laughs> human action to take? So again, I don't know if that's too complicated. I mean, it, sure, it's very complicated. But again, this is why I think it, it tends to be obfuscated. It tends to be hard for people to understand. And, um, you know, these are things as a society we have to collectively manage, right? We have to, we have to come to terms with Bitcoin was invented. We have to come to terms that the invention of Bitcoin allows the creation of other systems that may do things with that invention that are not good for people. And we may have to decide what that means for us, right? So the pure anarcho-capitalist, you know, standpoint would be, you know, Bitcoin exists, it's the absolute money, but I can't stop anybody from using any other cryptocurrency. I don't want a government to stop them from using any other cryptocurrency. And, you know, to the extent that they want to claim that these cryptocurrencies are any other thing other than Bitcoin or that whether they are Bitcoin or better than Bitcoin, I can't stop that. So therefore uh, it should endure. Um, is that how societies have generally proceeded with things? Not really. Generally, there's some sort of central regulatory government organization that tries to, you know, intercede in these things or put some sort of labeling on these on these different inventions uh, or, you know, again, try to step in in a way that protects users in some meaningful way. I would argue from the standpoint of someone who's participating in the cryptocurrency market, it is obscenely hard to get enough information to understand how you are how you are participating in that uh, you're really greeted with a sheet of numbers that all seem to be appreciating in us dollar value uh, and a stack of white papers that include thousands of terms you've probably never heard before uh, so again expecting the cryptocurrency market to provide some rational data on what is going on here uh, to me seems very optimistic it could be happening but i i mean again i i just i just don't know what you would do um in that situation, other than buy a bunch of cryptocurrencies and try to make dollars. And I think that's what a lot of people are doing, right? So from the standpoint of Bitcoin proponents, um, you know, we that is another fight that we have to have now, right? We not only have to defend Bitcoin and argue why it's better than the existing fiat system, we have to argue why Bitcoin's better than this other cryptocurrency system. We have to understand it. We have to be able to argue against it effectively. Um, and I think we have to be able to, to, to tell people what's going on in those systems. And in many cases, right, the, the obfuscation is a deliberate part of the tactics of the people who are, who are engaging in it. Yeah, if you take just some term, if you just take decentralization, for example, there's a lot of things flying under the flag of decentralization nowadays, but that there's not many things that term can apply to that sustain themselves without some sort of you know, proof of stake or authority maintaining them. And, you know, Bitcoin is like the only of those things that I can think of, but what does decentralization mean to you? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I think decentralization means that uh, as far as we've figured it out in Bitcoin, it means that uh, there's a maximum number of peers, right? So there's a maximum number of people who are actually running the software, right? Uh, let's, let's just imagine for a second that CoinMarketCap had a, had a figure that said number of people running the software, <laughs> you know, against the market cap. I would be very interested to see what that number was. How many people are running the Dogecoin software? Like, think about that for a second. The answer is probably not really anybody. Like, nobody is actually downloaded. The, so the cryptocurrencies are softwares. <laughs> they are they are soft peer-to-peer -peer software systems. Uh, but in many cases, the way the cryptocurrency market functions, again, there's a deliberate obfuscation in that these things aren't actually operating that way. So again, let's just take the number of, of how many Dogecoin users there are. Probably not that many. So in Bitcoin, you know, what do we want to see? We want to see people operating the software. We want to see people able to use it in a way that's low cost, right? So right now we, you know, you run a node in Bitcoin, it's fairly cheap. You can buy a Raspberry Pi. There's no people who can sell you Bitcoin nodes. You spin up, people are validating the blockchain and enjoying the same rights and privileges as anybody else. Uh, so I think with the centralization with, with Bitcoin, you sort of start to ask who are users, right? And what are their rights and what rights do they want? And in Bitcoin, I think, you know, the collective Bitcoin users have decided that, Decentralization means a robust group of peers, all of whom are running the Bitcoin software and all of whom can, uh, to the extent that they want to reject any change uh, that is unwanted, their ability to do so uh, is very high, right? Do other systems, are they built that way? No, so are they decentralized? I'm not sure, right? In Bitcoin, what we can see is that the software provides users with a, a high degree of rights and privileges. People seem to be able to exercise those privileges, uh, even in ways that would be unpalatable for the developers uh, of other cryptocurrencies. That seems to be something where if you think that there should be a technology in the world that guarantees people to the right to money without interference, uh, those would appear to be qualities that you want. So I guess to me, I would say decentralization within money systems I would define that a lot more clear and cleanly. I would say, do you have the right to your money? Absolutely. In any case where you would disagree with anyone. And Bitcoin, I think we have the highest degree of assurances that it provide, is providing that. If your money exists in some state where it only exists because it is recognized by some group, I think that that system starts to look a lot like the existing fiat system in which again your rights are recognized by some group there may be in one case a democratically elected group of people in the second case it may be an amorphous market uh, which one of those is better or worse I, I don't know but i have a feeling that the next era of cryptocurrency uh, experimentation that, that feels like something we're going to learn a lot, a lot about as people start opting in and out of the systems. So where let's, let's just say you had, you know, uh, unlimited finances to put toward, um, Bitcoin development in terms of education or like proper software development or adoption, like what, where do you want to see, um, Bitcoin five, 10 years from now? Like, what do you want to see? Uh, globally out of it? Huh, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think that we need to continue to advance uh, this idea that Bitcoin is money, right? That, and we think we need to come to accept that uh, it's a form of money that provides a level of rights to money that has never existed before uh, in human history. And that that is something that if you are biased towards human rights and liberal values uh, and that you want to see you know people exist in this world with a high degree of personal freedom that is a vision that you should support so again i think with bitcoin it's not so much the technology it, it continues to be that bitcoiners are radicals we, we think differently about how the world should be uh, but we also want to empower people in ways that they haven't been before. So, I mean, I think to me, it's almost the messaging part that's the most important. I think Bitcoin, it's been, it's been very confusing over the years to figure out what Bitcoin is, what it's trying to do. I think the current version of Bitcoin is, you know, we certainly understand it the most that we possibly can at this point. 
Um, and I think we've learned a lot about the Bitcoin system over the years. Um, I'm not sure Bitcoin always was what it is now, uh, but the fact that Bitcoin is what it is now is important, right? There are various periods in the Bitcoin history where we might not have ended up with the Bitcoin that we have now. So I think evangelizing for the Bitcoin we have now, educating people about it, um, is really the point. The development stuff, I think, will take time, and I think it'll take you know interested parties, and it'll take people pushing things forward. Um, but that's not really the part that I'm worried about, right? I think we've seen things like Lightning develop. Uh, it was you know almost as fast as people can think about them. Lightning Network was a paper five or six years ago. Now it's a you know fueling inter economic interactions in an entire country. Um, so I guess, you know, maybe to me, I think that's the point that I, you know, continue to want to put a lot of my work into is helping people figure out what is Bitcoin. Uh, you know, we can be deep in it all day, but for a lot of the people, they're still asking it for the first time. Um, you know, we've got to, we've got to try to give them some answers about this thing. What, what my big worry is I think in like 30 years or whatever, you know, where, whatever your timeline is where Bitcoin, if you believe in hyper Bitcoinization, I think big hyper Bitcoinization is going to be a very, troubling time for a lot of people it's going to be an immense period of upheaval in the world and i think we should try to give people in that moment as much empathy and understanding as we can by owing them an explanation for what this thing is and i think that to me has has become sort of my uh motivating operation i think that that change is going to be jarring for people I believe that, that that change is needed, having the time to examine the arguments, but I don't think that people are going to be in the position uh, where they're going to be very friendly to that change if there's not something that can help them understand it. So I think that continues to be the point of emphasis that I'm most worried about, um, because I think when humans are fearful and when humans are, are worried, they tend to do you know, very drastic things. And I think uh, we should be mindful that, again, that, that Bitcoin isn't going to be for everyone um, the same experience as it was for us. I, I think that if you think Bitcoin is going to continue to be you posting funny memes and looking at a chart that's always going up without any human consequence, <laughs> like life is going to probably be, <laughs> be very, uh, the, the change might be upsetting for you as well, because I, I don't think that's a continued state of the world. I have this uh, saying where I say like, you know, I don't think we're going to chuckle and meme our way to hyper Bitcoinization. I think the fact that we're still chuckling and memeing about hyper Bitcoinization uh, probably tells you a lot about where we are. And I think it's worth thinking about the later stages of that, where it becomes threatening to people and it becomes destabilizing to people. And I think in that point, oh, we, we will owe them some explanation for, for what is happening. Um, and so I would hope that we can, at that point, provide them uh, what I would want in that situation if it was, if it was happening to me. Yeah, for sure. I, I kind of see an... Um intermediate uh like near-term future where countries who are dollarized such as el salvador continue to or they dollarize through bitcoin um and we collapse like the amount of world currencies to just a few um i think cryptocurrencies like help perpetuate this idea that there there is a market of some sort for competing currencies also like government currencies and what do you think like the US dollar plays in this in this role going forward for Bitcoin? Or do you think they're totally like orthogonal to each other? Um, I mean, I think that, um, you know, one of the examples that used to be touted a lot that I think is probably worth thinking about or that I seem to think about more than most people that I know is that, you know, look what happened with Amazon and Walmart. Amazon came out, leveraged the internet and bootstrapped itself, but Walmart still exists. Uh, if you look at that analogy, you can think of the US dollar as Walmart, you can think of Bitcoin as Amazon, right? So what does that say to you? Is that generally technological changes of a certain magnitude, they, they happen over decades and usually you end up with a couple competitors, generally one of which was part of the older system, but just had the capital to continue innovating and you know stay pace with the disruptor. Um, so yeah, I tend to look at the e-commerce e like revolution as, as a good analogy. It's something that's going to take a long time because I think, you know, again, not everybody has Bitcoin today. 
sure they might have a way to gain financially from that disruption but i again i'm i'm not really sure about that right like people also gain they also have something to gain from the continued the system that they're currently part of perpetuating so you know those two incentive structures will also be at war for some period of time so yeah i guess i like to look at the e-commerce thing i i, I think the us dollar will find a way to be competitive for some time i think that um you know, I'm not sure how it'll play out. I think, you know, that there's reasonable case to think that, you know, Bitcoin will eventually kind of exist in a state where, you know, there's a few other world currencies that are competing against it. Um, I'm not sure why it wouldn't, right? These certainly the US has a network effect that it can leverage, <laughs> I guess, you know, if they want to issue some sort of central bank digital currency uh, type thing against Bitcoin. But, I, you know, I always try to kind of go back and explain people that curve, right, where it's, you know, what is the trajectory for Bitcoin? It's, well, Bitcoin was invented out of nothing and spontaneously monetized on the Internet, and it will one day likely be a major competitor, if not the dominant player on the world currency stage, <laughs> like a stage, right? So that's the narrative that I would expect to see. How much of that I see in my lifetime? Like, I'm not sure. And I, I, certainly, I would say that the... Uh, it is already wildly exceeding my expectations, uh, given that I've been here for not even 10 years and I've seen a country uh, adopt a currency that was, you know, uh, invented by people that no one knows on the Internet. <laughs> so uh, to me, it, the, it's that scale of that story, I think, that continues to be fascinating, um, though, you know, um, it's funny, like Bitcoin can feel like it develops very fast and then sometimes it can feel very slow. There's a real disparity, you know? Um, so I think people who are in this bull market for the first time, you're still in a bull market. This is the good times. Uh, but you know, there are slow periods, even, even when things are going well. So, uh, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but it, that's some of how I think about the future state. I, I don't pretend to have all the answers. I tend to like to inject in this conversation, the idea that the future may be more unkind to the Bitcoiners than we think, um, because it's generally the case that people who are trying to achieve economic freedoms on behalf of others tend to face some type of scrutiny uh, up to and including, uh, you know, scrutiny that puts a lot of personal harm <laughs> like in their, in their path. <laughs> so uh, something to keep in mind, you know, if you're on this journey with us. Yeah. Do, do you see yourself having a, a sort of bug out plan or receding into anonymity somehow? I feel like I entered uh, with a public persona. And so because of that, I never really had the time to ask that question, right? I In 2013, as soon as I started reading about Bitcoin, I started writing about it. Um, so I never really had the luxury to examine that question. I mean, certainly, you know, would buy be a cartoon penguin on the internet if I could right now? Sure. I think that's vastly preferable <laughs> uh, to being public on this. Um, you know, I would say at my future trial, like I would probably wager in my defense that I've, I've always been, I've always tried to explain Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies to the extent that I knew how. Uh, and to the extent that I was limited by the overall human understanding of the thing, uh, I would seek clemency <laughs> for that. <laughs> and hopefully so, some, some leniency <laughs> on whoever the sentencing party was. <laughs> so do you... What do you think the role is of this kind of like identity of Bitcoiners, you know, people calling themselves Bitcoiners? I know you have some interesting thoughts about that. Yeah, uh, I think I love evolved is that I think actions are either aligned to Bitcoin or they're or they're not aligned with Bitcoin. And, um, you know, there are no Bitcoiners, right? Either what you're doing is good for Bitcoin or it's not. And whether I don't think that people exist in an absolute state. I think we've seen this time and time again with Bitcoin over the years where, you know, we vault these kind of industry leaders, uh, you know, up to a pantheon and then their values misalign with ours. Uh, and then, you know, they're sort of burned at the stake. Um, I think that, you know, again, that's because we want people to represent some ideal to us, which is weird that even Bitcoiners sort of fall for that, right? That even in a system where you're trying to build and remove authority, uh, you know, we, we kind of, you know, build them up and burn them down the same way we do in the regular system. So I would just say, you know, have empathy for those people as well, right? I think um, I don't consider myself a Bitcoiner. If you consider myself me a Bitcoiner, then that's great. It's very flattering. I would appreciate that. Um, but I continue to view my actions as either being aligned with Bitcoin or against or against Bitcoin because I feel like it's irrational to 
to think that you're always going to be aligned with Bitcoin. You might not be aligned with Bitcoin and that might be okay. And that might say a lot about you and your choices. And, and that doesn't mean that, or it may say something about Bitcoin and what it says about Bitcoin might be meaningful to other people, <laughs> in which case, you know, you should advocate for it. I don't think there's a right answer there. Yeah. Like it seems like the most aligned you could be with Bitcoin ever would be to just kind of like never spend it or move your, your coins again, like Satoshi, you know, that's like the ultimate offering to the network. <laughs> And some people would say, you know, exactly the opposite. I would say like there's a great Mersha Popescu quote where he says talking with about Bitcoin, even in a group of people talking about Bitcoin does not make you a part of Bitcoin, which I think is always like really kind of stuck with me over the years because, you know, you are not Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin does not need you, uh, yet you can align with Bitcoin and, and help Bitcoin uh, succeed, right? So therefore, I think that, uh, you know, this expectation we, we have that people should always sort of uphold our values or either that even that our values will stay consistent i think is is bizarre right um i don't know I, and i also like you know there are no interneters out there right i mean yeah i feel like bitcoiners will <laughs> you know we probably want to get past this whole thinking that everybody thinks the same thing as us right diversity of ideas is good um but again i think we need to continue to understand where we're building right i think there are some questions uh, you know you can already see within bitcoin i would say you know i'm not sure what it means to build on bitcoin these days i think we've had so many arguments about what, what bitcoin is i think you know it, you as these kind of things develop you can lose part of something else and then you'll have to go and ask questions and cook and say why have we lost that but i think that you know uh, I appreciate people who ask meaningful questions about bitcoin i think that's something we should all aspire to um, as we try to figure out how to move this thing forward together. I think that uh, ideas that there should be some sort of philosophical or ideological purity, I mean, those have also never really served movements very well. So I would probably try to, to distance ourselves from those. So what are your um, just general pieces of advice for someone who's lost in this kind of like altcoin and Bitcoin space and so far as they understand the two to be mixed? How do we sort this out besides reading your piece? Yeah, um, that's a good question. Um, I don't know. I mean, this is something I keep going back to, right? Is like, how do you provide a clarity of entry point to people? Um, I don't think there's a right answer, right? I think um, in many cases, the best future Bitcoiners might be people building on other blockchains. They might not be doing that for reasons that we don't understand. And they might not even know the reasons they're doing that themselves. And they might be bored. Maybe they just want to be entertained, right? Um, I think the most compelling argument that I've heard for Bitcoin to date is again, going back to the sort of rights argument that, that Bitcoin is aligned with, with human prosperity and, and our, our values as, as a species. And uh, that's something to get us, you know, where we're going and that will increase freedom for, for people. Right. I think that the, the more we can kind of uh, make that argument, the more that that argument is true uh, and the more that others are able to internalize that argument, I think the more appealing it will be for people to build within the Bitcoin system. You know, the appeal of the cryptocurrency market right now is get, uh, get rich quick, right? Bitcoiners are not here for that. The more you can tell people that you're not here to get rich quick, uh, I think, you know, <laughs> the more that people will start to realize that Bitcoiners and Bitcoin is different. You know, we're not here for U.S. dollar speculative gains. Like if you want to buy Dogecoin and you want to sell it to your friend uh, in the top of December, that's great. Someone is buying the other end of the trades. So actually, I strike that. I will say something to people, <laughs> people who are in the <laughs> cryptocurrencies. So if you're engaged in other cryptocurrencies, uh, someone is buying the other end of your trade. So just remember that. Like if you decide to unload, uh, you know, your bags, uh, wherever, someone has to buy that. So when you sell the top, someone has to buy the top. So think of that other person. <laughs> that's great. Any um, any closing remarks for today? I think that's probably as close as it's going to come, but I appreciate the time. I mean, you can find more of my work on Bitcoin Magazine, of course. Uh, I publish some long Bitcoin history stories if you're interested in that for Bitcoin Magazine. Otherwise, you can find my more kind of opinion column content over on Forbes and, uh, you know, continue to do work on open source grants and giving for the Kraken cryptocurrency exchange. So if you're working on a cool Bitcoin open source project and you need some financial support, uh, love to hear from you. Awesome. Thanks, Pete.